Welcome back, everybody, to the Sustaniacs. A great episode we have on a tap for you today. I'm Michael Vincent, just trying to figure all this stuff out. And she's Emma Whiteman. Emma, how are you today? Hey, I'm doing great. Um, we have a super cool show today. Um, we have from highly on today, Thomas Healy. Thomas, you want to introduce yourself? Absolutely. So, uh, Emma, Michael, thanks for having me on the show. Uh, as you guys know, Michael, we've chatted a bunch in the past, but yes, actually, yes, we have. our whole company focus is around sustainability, moving to alternative uh, sources of energy in order to be able to reduce pollution. And the big focus is semi trucks. We go after the long haul over the road trucking market. Uh, those big diesel consuming trucks that you see driving down the highway every single day. Our whole goal is let's shift them over to electrification. Let's make these trucks cleaner, greener, but let's be practical about it. That's the thing that, you know, I guess pet peeve of mine, uh, you could say, is there's so many ideas out there that uh, of how we should make a, the, the, the um, environment cleaner. But uh, the reality is that some of them aren't all that easy to do or all that practical to do. So that's what we try to stay grounded in. It's got to be practical. It's got to work. And it's got to have a positive outcome for the environment. Yeah. So, Thomas, it's kind of like I, I liken you guys or, or you really to one of my favorite actors. And it's not Christopher Walken. It's actually Jeff Goldblum. Christopher Walken is actually my favorite actor, but Jeff Goldblum in uh, Jurassic Park, right? Uh, there's people out there that, that are spending so much time figuring out can they, they're not figuring out should they, right? And you guys are kind of in that, okay, we need to get to this green, this zero carbon emissions, but we need to do it in the exact right way. Uh, well, maybe not the exact right way because, you know, perfection comes out of chaos and, and so does, so does uh, uh, you know, you know, innovation. Uh, innovations come come out of it as well uh and you well know that so um it's really interesting what you guys are doing there um and just like you said th the people that watch this show are not a bunch of truckers like the last time you and i have have talked right probably none of these guys none of them are going to run out and buy a class eight vehicle <laughs> i don't know, you <laughs> they, know. It's possible. Right, they, 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 they might be but if, they are buying stuff that's a ride in a highly on semi truck they're probably going to want to be a trucker how about that <laughs> oh that now that's pro that's probably true cuz you're one of the very few that are electrifying the the power train right but you still have the pull horn for the for the for you know the pull chain for the horn which and, uh, and is Dooner woke up our whole engineering team with that uh, that air <laughs> horn so <laughs> no it, but it, yeah to your point so what what we do just for anyone who's watching don't know the highly on backstory it's we're a powertrain company, so we work with the truck OEMs. We design the electrified system behind them. But going back to that practicality standpoint is uh, there's a huge push going on towards BEV plug-in vehicles. And we're not naysayers to BEV plug-in, but we don't see that BEV plug-in is the right solution for the whole market. Uh, if you think about short haul, final mile, the grid can supply the electricity to, uh, to power those vehicles. Once you get into that long haul space, though, the amount of power these trucks consume is huge. Uh, you know, there's um, there's tons of studies out there of like, you know, comparing you know, one semi compared to thousands of houses of, uh, of electricity, you know, in terms of how much they use. So so what our philosophy is, is for the long haul space, you really need a range extender vehicle. You bring a fuel with you on board. Now, that fuel could be hydrogen. It could be natural gas. And then you produce the electricity as you're driving to charge the batteries. So you don't give up the the kind of the big positives of what a normal diesel has, which is 500, 600 miles of range or over that, uh, you know, per day that they're driving. Uh, you don't give any of that up, but you pull pull forward all the benefits of electrification. And we can we'll dive into a ton of details on uh, on all. Oh that yeah, no, we no, we certainly will. Um, and and just you know, for for uh, simplicity and everybody, BEV is a battery electric vehicle. A lot of these acronyms that we use, Thomas, a lot of people don't understand what the heck they are outside of our outside of our industry. It's 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 shocking to me after thirty four years that I've in trucking that I've learned stuff that other people don't know because usually you know it's your last resort type of uh, career. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, speaking. Speaking of that, why Thomas? What 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 led you to do this? What led you to start Highland to get into this? And and if it's, it was a green initiative, why'd you pick Class Eights? Sure. So uh, yeah. So at the time when I started Highland, I was in uh, in college. I was at uh, Carnegie Mellon University up in Pittsburgh. I had a uh, a double major in while well, I was an undergrad for engineering and public policy, which really is about how do you take engineering uh, knowledge and apply it in an effective way? One of the big 
uh, pushes it, obviously, was around sustainable technology. And uh, I had this professor, uh, super awesome guy, his name's Professor uh, Jay Apt, or otherwise known as Astronaut Jay Apt. Uh, he's been to outer space a few times, and, uh, and he, he challenged the class. He said, come up with an idea that not only can be positive for the environment, but also can make smart business sense and could be something that someone would adopt purely on the business economics, but then can have that upside of the environment. And that's that's what Hylion is. That's the, the forefront of it. I mean, that's where uh, we realize, you know, if we bring some solution that costs a gazillion dollars to a trucking fleet and say, hey, this is going to be good for the environment. It might ruin your uh, your, your uh, <laughs> economics or your business, but yeah. uh, it's great for the environment. Go buy it. No one's going to. And, uh, and that's why we, the solutions we're working on actually, you know, have some great cost benefits to them, uh, but then also have the emission side. And, uh, you know, the, another thing we should uh, put it on the whiteboard because we, we should ch chat about it today is just like all the different, uh, the different philosophies of how electrification is going to happen. And, and uh, you know, we'll, we'll, I guess another pet peeves, maybe we have a lot of pet peeves here, but like it's uh, not all electrification is equal. And we think you really got to look at the whole picture. You can't just look at like, you know, the example I use frequently is if, if you go buy an electric car and you plug it into your wall outlet and, uh, and that electricity is coming from a coal fired power plant, you're probably not helping. Uh, and so from that standpoint, but, you know, you got to look at the details behind it. Yeah, those are all excellent, excellent statements and exactly what I want to dig into today. So there, there's there's a bunch of different ways to theoretically get to carbon zero vehicles, right? There, there's or there's there's different players that are going from there. What are the differences between those? You talked about a BEV or battery electric vehicle, right? And then there's some that are internal combustion engines, but they're they want to combust an alternative fuel that is clean as well. Uh, and then you have the hybrid type of models that are out there. I think those are the, like the three different kind, or, or maybe there's more. I don't know. You tell me. What are the various solutions that are out there quickly, and what are kind of those the the differences or benefits there? Yeah. So trucking today, ninety nine percent of the trucks out there are diesel powered. So it's like yeah. everything runs on diesel. As you mentioned, you have another segment that is an internal combustion engine that either using natural gas or hydrogen combusting it to drive uh, you know, the, the rear axles of the vehicle. Interesting. It's a, uh, there's, there's pros and cons of it. Uh, we see that really, our belief is the market really needs to move into electrification. Reason being is that uh, if you think about emissions, we like to put them into two different buckets. You have the overall emissions that come from a, a vehicle, like, and, and with that, you gotta look at where did your electricity come from or where did the fuel come from? So you kind of look, it's called well to wheel is, uh, is what most people refer to mm -hmm. it as. You, mm -hmm. you look totally holistically. Uh, the other thing you need to look at is, well, what actually comes out of the, the tailpipe of the vehicle? And the reason that this is important is because, you know, if, a, if you have a big diesel guzzling uh, semi truck that's sitting right next to your kid's uh, elementary school, right next to the playground, that emissions is extremely harmful versus if that mm. truck is out in the middle of nowhere where there's not much population, you know, that that emissions produces much less harm while it's out in that area. Now, granted, going back to my first thing from a well to wheel standpoint, the emissions are the same, right? So that's why we try to break it into two buckets. It's what's the overall emissions and then where are you going to put that emissions? And that's where if you have uh, electric vehicles and electric range extender vehicles, you have the ability that when you are out in the open road, you can turn that generator on, charge the batteries as you're driving. But then when you get in city limits, when you get next to that elementary school, when you go into a port, you can turn the generator off and just drive on the battery pack. And then that allows you to have zero tailpipe emissions and you know reduce the emissions in those high pollution areas. Yeah, and that and that would uh, reduce the emissions over over the entire length of the trip as well, right? Because percentages of it is is running like that. Um, in, in so there's also the model where you're carrying the generator right there on it for the range or the range extender type of model, right? And and so you're looking at utilizing what fuel for that for that uh, range extender. Yeah, so we actually are starting with natural gas and evolving into hydrogen. So this is another okay. thing. All of you have heard uh, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles often spoken about, right? That's often thought of as the euphoria solution of where the, the industry wants to get to is using hydrogen. Um, 
it, it can, keynote is can, be a, uh, a, a, a very green fuel. Uh, there's the, the caveat there is a, a lot of hydrogen that's produced today is actually more pollutive than even, even diesel trucks. And that comes from how it is produced. Oh, uh, so there's, there's different buckets of where hydrogen produced. We can get into all that, but to get to just answer your question here. So our philosophy is, is natural gas, the there's infrastructure out there for refueling. Uh, the cost of natural gas is low and the emissions of, of natural gas, specifically re renewable natural gas, are fantastic. Uh, over 50 percent of the fuel sold last year came from renewable sources at natural gas stations. And what that means is, uh, you know, it's basically you're using pollution to produce electricity on board your truck. So anyone that's new to the RNG story, RNG is basically uh, methane coming off of landfills, dairy farms, and you're capturing it, you're pumping it into the pipelines, and then you get to use it uh, to power the vehicle. And that's where we see, let's do that today. And then eventually we'll get to hydrogen once there's green hydrogen out there. So yeah, am I pulling up? Am I pulling up to a farm and throwing some cow manure in my tank? Is that what I'm doing? <laughs> Effectively, yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's uh, so this is something this was new to me when I started diving into this. Like, if you have a pile of manure, you have a tremendous amount of methane that's just gassing off of that, right? And methane sure. is extremely harmful for the environment. And so what farms are actually starting to do is they're putting all that manure together. They're, uh, they're actually able to capture it as it's gassing off. Landfills are doing the same thing. They're covering the landfill. Uh, think of it like a big tarp is going over the landfill. And then they're, they're uh, siphoning off all that methane. And then we're able to use that methane as a, a fuel on board the vehicle. And, and that's much better for the environment than just letting that methane gas off and go up into the atmosphere. Very cool. Very yeah. cool. Did you have a question, Emma? I did, but I forgot. I, I mean, it's, it's okay. so interesting that I feel like I'm, you know, one big thing that's very interesting to me to hear you say is like, when I talk to people, they're always like, okay, well, yes, this thing is more sustainable on the surface. It looks great. It looks much better, but okay, go back and trace it from its origin. Are you doing more harm than good? When you're, you know, when you're using glass instead of plastic, for example, and the glass is so much heavier, so it's causing more emissions and all this stuff, that looks great. But then when you look at it really from the source, like more energy to make it, that sort of thing. So it feels mm -hmm. very cool to me that you're thinking it through from the beginning to the end. Where is our energy coming from? I don't want to use this energy until I know it's coming from a spot where it's not doing more harm than good. So yeah. I guess that was just what I was going to say is, is it, that, you know, no, it's great. When you do the research and live intentionally within that, you know, it's interesting because you've got 74% by some studies as high as 77% of the consumers, if they're given two options, they're going to buy uh, from the more sustainable or the greener company, right? And so that is just a matter of time before that bleeds over to the transportation and logistics a a as well, right? But my, my question, Thomas, is this, if, if hydrogen is, uh, it takes a lot of energy, and I've heard that before, I'm no scientist, but I've heard that before, it takes a lot of energy to produce it, and therefore that's not all that green. The production of it isn't all that green. And the RNG that you're utilizing right now and, and talking about, you're talking about as if it's a stepping stone or stopgap. Why change? Because it seems like it's actually uh, negative carbon, right? So why, why, why move my move forward? Is the hydrogen believed to be a better source eventually for power or energy density or, or whatnot once they figure out how to make it in a more sustainable manner? Yeah, so it, it's a valid question of why wouldn't you just do renewable natural gas uh, for every vehicle out there, right? Well, yeah, and, the, and why ever consider hydrogen? Well, uh, the problem is eventually you do dry up how much renewable natural gas there potentially is out there, and uh, these numbers might be a little outdated, but you know it's within the last couple of years. There was some okay. uh, some carb studies that that looked at. If we were to capture in the U.S. all of the uh, the natural the renewable natural gas that's potentially out there, so you're capturing all this methane that's gassing off, it would be enough fuel to to uh, power a few hundred thousand vehicles, few hundred thousand semi trucks per year. So, uh, you know the semi truck world. I mean, that's a that's a huge impact. That's but that's sure. not all the trucks, right? There's a couple hundred. There's a couple of million uh, trucks in the U.S. right now, and so from that standpoint. 
we see that this is the right fuel to get started on, to move into electrification, uh, it, you know, use renewable natural gas, but it's not going to be the fuel for everything. Now, uh, so for hydrogen, uh, there are ways to make totally zero pollution hydrogen. And basically the way you do it is you have wind and solar, uh, that's your source of electricity. And then you do a process called electrolysis to produce the hydrogen. And if you do all that, uh, then you know you have zero pollution hydrogen. Last time I saw a number on this, it was like less than 5% of the hydrogen made in the US actually came from electrolysis and that process mm. of using green electricity to do it. Uh, the other 95% was coming from processes like steam methane reforming, uh, which is where in many instances, that is the, the, the emissions that come from that process are actually worse than running a diesel truck. Wow. Ooh, yeah. wow. So, so let's use the methane. And to is there's no one size fits all solution. I mean, we have to have kind of a bunch of different solutions. There's no like one thing we can strive for, or, or is it more of like, it's going to be piecemeal. Like we do eventually want to get somewhere, but we have to do it in bits and pieces to make sure we're doing it right. Yeah. So at least the way I'm seeing it, and and this is controversial. I mean, you have you have some people that are saying like, we need to go to hydrogen today, and that's the only thing we should be considering. We need to go to BV plug in a day. It's the only thing we should be considering. Uh, personally, I, I view it as there's not going to be a one size fit all solution. Uh, the, the the transportation sector has been uh, has been accustomed to a one size fits all solution in diesel fuel and in petroleum. Right. That's not going to be the wave of the future. And we need to really evolve with the different fuel sources. So actually, we believe that, um, you know, having more of a transitory or transitional model where we can start off with using natural gas today, we can evolve into using hydrogen, we could maybe evolve into using ammonia, uh, you know, different types of fuels that also have a lot of promise makes more sense because, um, you know, and, and it, it's going to go based on the application. So if you're a trucking fleet that is located right next to Niagara Falls. You're only driving 100, 150 miles a day, and uh, and you could charge up at night with the excess electricity, totally green electricity coming off of Niagara Falls, and then drive all day, come back at night, do the same thing over again. You've got a perfect model, right? But if you're the the fleet that's sitting next to a coal fired power plant to get your electricity, that's not a perfect model. But on the surface, to someone you know that doesn't dive into the details both fleets would be adopting electric plug-in trucks and doing good for the environment. Interesting. Yeah, those are all great, great, great points. Because we're getting into the, you're getting into the, I believe, past scope one of what a company can do, right? Scope one is like your direct carbon footprint, right? And so if you're a carrier, the emissions obviously are the direct scope one. Now, where you get that power from, et cetera, you get into two, three, and and so on and so forth, right? So the is, is does this mean as you're talking about these various different things, will there be a single winner or will there be multiple winners? And does that make more sense given the different applications that make sense for each of the solutions? I'm definitely in the bucket of multiple winners. I think uh, my guess as to what the buckets are is for kind of up to 200 miles, you're going to use BEV plug-in vehicles, use the grid to recharge. After that, 200 mile range, you need a range extender truck. We're going to start with natural gas. And, you know, I've had some people say, well, you know, hydrogen's only two years away. I personally don't see that, don't believe it. In terms of like real adoption, yeah. are there going to be onesie twosie trucks out there that are going to run on hydrogen? Absolutely. And, you know, and those will be deployed, they'll do well. At, but for true adoption, I think natural gas is going to be the, the fuel source for a while. And then if and when hydrogen becomes more prevalent, there's green hydrogen, then we start evolving into that as the, the fuel to produce electricity on board the truck. Um, but it's not going to be a one size fits all sort of solution. And there's other projects going on that show promise as well, like uh, renewable diesel or biodiesel, right? Uh, those, you know, there's um, a lot of a lot of work being done there. I think uh, it's not as easy as just using renewable natural gas, but um, but it's not I'm not saying that it shouldn't be worked on. Yeah, yeah. 1992, I was a city dispatcher for Roadway Express in Copley, Ohio. We had half of our fleet were LNG trucks. 
1992, you- I was born as well. <laughs> <laughs> they were they were they were crappy. I think we lost half the fuel just driving around from evaporation. Uh, no, once no, the I tank, I don't know that um, abbreviation. I'm not a trucking person. What's the LNG? Look- La- liquid natural gas. They were liquid Ooh. natural gas. They were part of liquid God. natural gas. Uh, it was part of an initiative with East Ohio Gas. They were they were, they they sucked. Drivers hated dr- just That's because. Fair. I mean, it, it wasn't it wasn't there. The the energy and the power as the tank emptied, it got less and less horsepower. And it, I mean, it was, you know, it was very early on trying to figure so, things so out. Thomas, there was no kind of danger. Based on, based on what Michael's saying, I, I was just thinking about this. Have you had success with bringing this to drivers? Like, are drivers on board for? this new um this new setup do they like the fact that they can switch the generator on and off or is it like another task they have to do like what kind of feedback have you got from from those sorts of stakeholders i guess hands down driver feedback on electric vehicles is unbelievable it's fantastic like uh we've had drivers say it goes from feeling like you're driving this uh this big uh, clunky vehicle to it feels like you're in your passenger car it's so smooth it's so seamless to drive uh the the things that you experience when you go from a diesel semi to an electric semi are it is so much quieter we just put out a video actually this week where we showed like decibel readings inside the uh the vehicles and uh i think the um and we can fact check this but i think it was like the diesel truck was equivalent to like a a lawnmower or something like that and ours was more of equivalent to like the the noise level of a uh conversation uh and that was when you were inside the cab right uh so it's quieter it's got instant acceleration instant torque right you step on the gas and it's it's off Uh, we showed a video as well of a diesel next to a uh, an electric semi and you just see the electric semi pull away from the diesel and uh and then inside the cab there's just a lot less vibration as well which if you're spending 11 hours a day inside a semi truck and that yeah. wears on you uh michael oh, yeah. you, you must hear from drivers all the time oh, I mean, oh yeah 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 i was just thinking thomas i'm sure you guys are looking into the health benefits of an electric vehicle versus an internal combustion regardless of the fuel that's being exploded inside the cylinders it's got to be a positive there, there I was has to be say, even just the noise pollution alone. I mean, I'm sure you get drivers with tinnitus if it's that if it's that loud for 11 hours a day. I mean, I'm sure it's just the noise difference alone would probably make a huge difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah and I it, would think so. There's the benefit to the driver. Then you think about the environment benefit to the environment as well. You look at New York, they've already started putting uh, noise ordinances in as to when you can actually drive diesel semi trucks into the city and when you cannot because they're trying mm-hmm. to reduce the noise. Well, if you've got an electric semi truck, you're fine, right? You can drive in whatever time you want, right? Because you're not going to be waking people up. I was actually uh, just in New York and uh, I was doing investor meetings yesterday and uh, our CFO was there with me and he was complaining. He's like, yeah, you know, 4 a.m. came around and you start hearing all the the noise outside, all the trucks and everything. And, uh, you know, that an electric semi truck can clean all that up. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah. And you, you would. Uh, so you, you read about the, the driver parking. You stay abreast of all the issues that are out there. And parking is a huge issue with drivers. Uh, Emma, I don't know if you realize this, but there's only one parking space per 11 drivers in the United States for truck drivers. Uh, and then you've got places in cities like uh, some of the boroughs there in New, New York. And there's other places as well that have uh, put in bans because of the noise from the trucks and the pollution from the trucks. I would imagine this would alleviate a bit of those issues too. Uh, the not in my backyard crowd would be uh, have a little less ammunition little more uh, uh, yeah. and defense, right? Uh, so, Thomas, here's here's one of the things that I hear about all the time, and nobody can ever. And I look it up, and I I don't get the information. I've actually spouted it as well without having a ton of facts. Is that um, the production of and the disposal there of batteries is really bad? Is that is that true and is it getting better or what, what what's the situation that can do you, do you know about that i imagine you have a little bit of an opinion on that yeah i do i think uh my my opinion is is we are still in the kind of infancy of learning about it i don't think it's really been solved yet and if you think about what tesla started shipping cars i don't know roughly a decade ago right well uh those cars are probably just starting to get towards their end of life you know they got mm-hmm. 100, 200,000 miles on them. Now we're trying to figure out what to do with the batteries. Now, 
the mass adoption of electric vehicles that's going on right now. And you know, I say mass adoption, it's still a small percentage of the overall vehicle sold, but it feels like a lot more than where we were 10 years ago. We've got another 10 years or five to 10 years to figure out what we're going to do with those batteries. So that's where I'm saying, I don't think it's solved yet because we haven't really seen a bunch uh, coming up at end of life. What I hope to see happen is, at least from what we've seen in vehicles, is you get to a point where a battery no longer really has a much, enough life anymore for operating in a vehicle. It's maybe seeing like a, a 20% degradation in its performance. And then mm -hmm. consumers are kind of like, hey, this uh, it's at the end of its life. I'm going to go get a new car. Well, that battery still has a lot of life. And so can we look at doing like grid storage? Can we take, you know, second life of a battery, put it in a, a stationary application and then, you know, peak shave uh, the electricity grid uh, or the electricity consumption on the grid in order to make the grid more efficient? That's what I hope to see happens. I think time will tell. Do we really go execute upon that? Yeah. And, and you know, well, our, our conversations of, of what I'm doing with OPT, um, I'll be looking at taking some of those batteries, <laughs> right? Uh, I mean, because you're right. It doesn't have to haul 80,000 pounds down the road anymore. Um, it, 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 can, it can store solar energy to run a micro recycling plastics plant, for instance, which takes a hell of a lot less energy to run it, right? Because it's in its degradation. It would, just a it random would example, Michael, that just was off the top of your yeah, head. Yeah, it was just, <laughs> it, it was totally not even planned, not even planned nothing. It was total... Totally random. OPT.Earth well, is what well, since, <laughs> since we're on it, so let's talk about the grid, right? Because this is another okay. thing that most people are like, hey, let's just plug all these electric semi trucks into the grid and uh, and it's going to be great. Yeah, as long as you're not in California, right? So that's that's where like I, I, the amount of people every day for the last week I've had saying, oh, did you see that article that said, <laughs> hey, don't plug your electric car in because the grid's overloaded? Well, yeah, imagine yeah. imagine like every product that everyone needs, uh, like our whole backbone of our country of moving goods around. We tell them all, hey, don't plug your truck in right now because, uh, you know, the grid's overloaded. Yeah, that's not going to work. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so from that standpoint, we look, we've looked at a ton of the stats. Uh, a couple that really stand out are, I've read something that said, plugging in 50 semi trucks is equivalent in the amount of electricity as uh, the entire electric consumption of the Empire State Building. 50 trucks, an entire uh, skyscraper, right? Uh, wow. Equivalent in electricity. Uh, another um, one that I, I read was uh, that... Uh, Two trucks plugged into the grid will consume more electricity than an entire uh, truck manufacturing plant. So you think about like a big uh, vehicle manufacturing plant, that's equivalent to plugging two trucks into the grid, right, in terms of electricity. So the grid can't support all these vehicles. It's it's not, uh, it's, yeah. it, it, there's not enough electricity. Well, and also the consumer should not have to pick up the slack because we need, like it, it, how am I trying to say? Trucking is very important. It is vital, 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 but we need to have another solution in place so both things can coexist. So the consumer can not be told, okay, you can't plug in your vehicle. You can't turn your lights on or your AC in the middle of a heat wave or whatever crazy thing. Like there needs to be a way that the consumer can prosper and trucking can prosper and the system itself can prosper. And it, it does seem like we're moving towards that, especially with your guys' help, which is, which is very, it's pretty cool. Yeah. And I'll do my little uh, plug here since, Michael, you did yours. So, yeah, just like uh, uh, just like we have the solution for the long haul space. Well, one of the things we actually just did was uh, we acquired a new technology, a new generator technology out of GE. Yeah. And, yeah, uh, very cool. So not only do we see this being a fantastic power plant on board the vehicle, to charge the batteries because it's fuel agnostic. It can run on that gas, run on hydrogen uh, and other fuels, but it's also much more efficient than conventional uh, generators. And so from that standpoint, we've actually brought it down. We've said, look, not only do we see this going into trucks, we also see that we could deploy these in stationary applications and actually use them to produce electricity to charge other people's electric vehicles, to be the power source behind chargers so that you could deploy BEVs in city kind of type applications, but not be reliant on the grid. You actually make your own electricity and do it much cheaper and much uh, cleaner than you know what a lot of electricity is coming from. I love that. 
So yeah, and that that leads me to the, to this because I asked you about this 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 question before, uh, and we didn't have a lot of time to dig into it a little. Uh, but so like like NASA, like the space program, uh, uh, the EV pioneers like yourself, right? And getting into these, there's a lot of um, exhaust technologies. Mm-hmm. Um, that that will be uh, benefit in in other locations, right? And one of them we talked about that is this new uh, technology you acquired, uh, I guess, in collaboration and from in collaboration with and from GE, right? Correct. And 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 that is this fuel agnostic generator, which could be then used in stationary applications, as you alluded to, with the charging units, right? Like in a tritium charger or wh- whoever it happens to be that manufacturer, right? Yeah, that's the goal. I mean, we our focus is can we make uh, clean and green and inexpensive electricity? And the Carnot generator does just that. I mean, some of the efficiency numbers are you know, 20% uh, more efficient than a, a conventional generator. And so when you and, and then even we did a comparison of uh, average grid electricity costs is around 12 cents per kilowatt hour. We're anticipating around a seven cents per kilowatt hour cost out of the Carnot. So the Carnot generator is the name of it. And so from that standpoint, like it's got great emissions profiles, obviously it can run on hydrogen as well, uh, but you know, even on conventional fuels, it's got great emissions profiles. It'll, we expect it'll pass all current and even future looking carb uh, mandates that are gonna be coming out when running on conventional fuels, but then it's also at this really low cost. So I guess my wow. question is too, would this help with like, I mean, there's some places in the US that are extremely, extremely remote. And I think that a big problem right now is that there's not a lot of charging stations for electric vehicles across the country. I mean, up where I am in New England, it's pretty common and and they're cropping up here and there. Like, will this help with that situation as well? Like being able to put more stationary charging stations across the country, even in remote locations? It absolutely will. And I think it even hits home more, uh, even with electric semi trucks, right? Going back to all those examples, like the Empire State Building and stuff, there was a fleet here in Texas wanted to adopt 50 plug in trucks, and uh, they got quoted $30 million by the utility provider just to change the transformers, install the chargers, all this stuff. It was like a huge, huge expense because the grid didn't have enough power going into that warehouse. Uh, And so, from that standpoint, you could just you know produce your own electricity not worry about upgrading all those transformers and uh and do it all localized on your site so absolutely you know i think this opens up a a really unique way of having distributed power generation uh and you know it's it's quiet it's uh, low maintenance and you know from our standpoint if we can use the same generator in trucks as what we can use on the grid then you're just going to get more commodities of scale. You're going to be able to drive the cost down of the overall systems as well. So we see it's it's like a really cool technology. Uh, it kind of future proofs things because it's fuel agnostic, but then even opens up these these other benefits of you know, solving charging problems that uh, you know fleets are facing today. Does that fuel agnostic system lead to developing a technology that allows for mixtures of different fuels, even though they have different energy densities within them? Like say, like you said, the RNG, there's not really enough, maybe a few hundred thousand trucks, which is significant, but it's still 300,000 trucks is only 1% of the trucks that are out there on the road. The class eights that are out there on the road or would require the diesel, right? But is the, does that technology now allow for a mixture of fuel or is that something that the technology you're looking into getting there. Yeah, and and just one one clarifier because uh, I'm sure someone will uh, will catch this. So it's ten percent, right? So it'll be it like three hundred thousand trucks. I think there's two to three million trucks on the road, right? So right, right. Yeah. What did I what did I say? What did I say? <laughs> one. I think you said one. Yeah. So oh, yeah, just, yeah. No, no, no. It's ten percent. Yeah, yeah. Twitter's yeah, right. going to be blowing up right after this. Hey, thing. he went to Carnegie. I didn't go to Carnegie Mellon. He went to <laughs> Carnegie Mellon. <laughs> All right, I'll just put the I'll, I'll put the disclaimer. I'll put the disclaimer at the end. Did not go to Carnegie Mellon. I'll just put that underneath my name. Oh my god, it's that engineer in me. I just wanted to make sure. All right, so now now I completely forget what the question. At least was. you're wearing at least you're wearing a purple shirt, dude. Yeah, I know. Hey, I was thinking of wearing pink, but I figured that was too much. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I said, is it, will it, it, it so it's fuel agnostic. Yep. 
can it now or is the goal and does it make sense to allow for mixed fuels since you have some fuels that are enough to like you said the rng will only hit 10 percent of the of the trucks on the road uh or if we captured all of it would only be this but then hydrogen is a little bit more difficult to do it sometimes you can gain some economies of scales by mixing two different technologies together is that a possibility with this agnostic thing or do the different densities and the energy kill that type of thing yeah so you maybe hit on one of like the the secret sauces of this thing which is it can run on mixtures uh, and it can run on fluctuating mixtures so you could give it 50 50 natural gas hydrogen you could do 70 30 you could do uh 100 hydrogen 100 nat gas frankly the generator doesn't care it's taking that fuel in it uses this super innovative process called flameless oxidation to produce heat and then that heat is what uh, drives a linear generator which produces electricity so from that standpoint kind of do mixes of fuels, uh, it's some days running on that gas, some days running on hydrogen, and it's it's fine. It, uh, it, it does all, the software and the thing uh, controls, you know, how to how to handle all that. So uh, no hardware changes needed in order to do those switches of fuel. So one of the questions that uh, we've gotten asked is, well, how's this going to work on a vehicle, right? Can you really have a, a hydrogen and uh, NAC gas capable vehicle? So to start, I see the way that it would work is you would have some tanks on the vehicle you know if you think of a nat gas truck it's got four natural gas tanks uh four or five depending on the vehicle so maybe you do a couple of them are nat gas a couple of them are hydrogen that gives you the ability to be fuel agnostic eventually what i would love to see happen and it's totally feasible just needs some engineering work is you actually just mix the fuels together in the vehicle so if i'm driving across the country and there's a hydrogen station uh i'll stop there i plug it in fuel up it fills up the tanks with hydrogen, I drive, you know, 500 miles, get to the next station and it's not gas, uh, you know, fuel it up and, uh, and then mixes it all in the tank. And once again, our generator doesn't care. It'll take it and make electricity out of it. <laughs> that would be really cool. Uh, I mean, no, like, I love it. I love it. I love so it. It's like putting a Mr. Fusion on your car. Um, I mean, it's like so, such smart technology. I don't even know what to say besides, wow. I mean, like to take, these two completely different things. Like if I put diesel in my car right now, it's like, you're done, you're over. So to be able to take like two different sources of energy and make one thing, it's 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 very impressive. I think that would be a awesome thing to so, start So is this is this a way to to solve uh, last question for for me really? I mean, there's a million more to go to, but we've we've got a lot of time into this, and I know Emma's got to get moving. I know you do as well, Thomas. I know you've got a day job as well. Um, <laughs> And I really appreciate your time today. But uh, do you see the uh, the technology that you're looking at? Because you don't see this type of stuff for for uh, the private citizen automobile. It's all just straight up electric plug in BEV uh, pickups from Rivian and and your Teslas and a ton of them there. A Cadillac, Subaru. Everybody's getting in the game, right? Um, does that continue forward, or does that? Uh, or, or are they just banking on the fact that someone like you is going to create uh, some technology that can be stationary at my house and I can run my whole house off of hydrogen or 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 a Mr. Fusion by Thomas Healy or something like that, right? So I guess what I see, the, the normal households, what, what they should have in the future is one BEV plug-in car and one full electric range extender car. So if you think about the normal household, uh, you know, Two individuals you usually commute so you could do your commuting all on electric you get back you plug it in you charge overnight that that's when the grid's not overloaded that all works but then you have that one range extender vehicle so if you do want to go on a road trip you uh you can use that vehicle and you know conventionally you're going to pull into a gasoline you know gas station and uh and fill it up and you know you you go on with your uh, your road trip uh, eventually, you know, I actually do think there's been a ton of work done on distributed power generations like at households. So to that idea, do you have, you know, uh, a Carno or something else sitting outside pr producing electricity? That is, uh, there's a lot of, uh, of thought that's going towards that just in the industry as a whole, because uh, setting up entirely new power plants is extremely expensive. It's uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. billions of dollars, right? And, uh, and if you all go if you go pull some of the stats as well new power plants aren't getting built right now right they've pulled back on building power plants and so 
uh, from that standpoint, you probably do start making distributed power generation. Uh, there are companies out there that work on it, like Bloom uh, is a big one. And so from that standpoint, does that is that a future technology of the Carno? Quite possibly. I mean, we've we've tried to say, look, we're we want we do want to conquer the world, but we got to be logical about it, and we got to start yeah. with trucking, and uh, and we got to get stuff deployed that's going to solve this problem in the trucking industry. So that's yeah. our focus. Yeah. But there are endless opportunities, honestly. Yeah. No, I wasn't trying to imply that you guys should spread yourself so thin that that it gets crazy. I was just the the technology sounds like something that someone could could uh, license and, and, and move forward as well. Yeah. I, I totally get it. Yeah. It's, it's great stuff. It's great stuff. Emma, you got a last question for our friend Thomas here. Oh man. I feel like I have like 500 last questions, but I guess he's I a watch. nice guy. He may come in uh, again on, in the future. Cause I, I'd really love to, to ask you and maybe, maybe I, I can just steal yours from you and, and ask you Thomas. And, and if you don't know, just say no and I'll cut it out. But if you do know, and you're really smart about it, I'll make you look good. It is, uh, do, you, do you have any opinions or any knowledge on the efforts to change plastic into hydrogen and, and into fuels and stuff like that? Because we've spoken to some people who are working on that technology, and they're pretty excited about some of the results that they have and producing some, some clean fuels out of it. So I'm aware that that work is going on. I am not aware of kind of the how it's being done. And, uh, and so I will, uh, I will defer to there's a lot of other people who are a lot smarter on it than I am. <laughs> Well, I think the coolest thing is, is that yeah. everybody is, I mean, when you're, when you start looking like, like Michael and I have over the past, like course of this podcast, you're finding that there's a lot of really smart and dedicated people doing a lot of really cool things. And, and it's almost all like very interconnected. Like, I almost feel like I could be like, oh, you should talk to this person about this and this and that, you know, like it's, it's, there is a community of people that are living intentionally and trying to make the world a better place, which is, which is pretty exciting. And the possibilities are endless. Once the innovation starts flowing in the way that it has, um, with you and with Hylion. Um, I mean, it's, it's exciting. It's exciting time and you guys are doing great work. So. Yeah. It's, it's uh, I mean, it's, it's pretty damn awesome to see, right? I mean, the amount of effort, the amount of individuals, companies that are working towards making the planet cleaner, trying to solve this climate change problem. It's great. I mean, the one thing that we just want to see more and more of is let's be practical about this, right? Don't, don't be the guy that's going to turn on a coal fire power plant to plug your electric vehicle in. Don't do that. <laughs> but, uh, but let's be, <laughs> let's be smart about this. Let's make the transition happen and, uh, we can solve this problem. It's not insurmountable, but we just got to be smart about it. Yeah, abs absolutely. We do. And there's baby steps and there's, don't be afraid to fail. And, uh, you can't be perfect when, when you start as, as you will know, you've got to pivot sometimes and you've got to go for it when you have that dream. I'm sure you didn't wait to be perfect to say, you know what, I'm going to start Highland. Uh, and, and, and that's what people do. And that's the purpose of this. And, and I love going back to the very beginning. I'm glad your professor asked that question yeah. because that's what we're trying to show people is that, it doesn't have to be an anchor. It's actually a way to move forward and improve the economic viability of being clean. It can be done. It's being done right now. Thomas is doing it. Thank you so much, Thomas. I know where to go. Emma now knows where to go. Where should everybody else go to learn more about what you guys are doing and, and tell their favorite person about it? Absolutely. So hylion.com, H-Y-L-I-I-O-N. And uh, you can check out our uh, our ticker symbol as well. We're trading on the New York Stock Exchange, H-Y-L-N. And uh, yeah, follow this journey with us. There's a lot of exciting stuff to come. Yeah, and there's a lot of cool stuff. You can reach it on that website too as well, where Thomas gets out there and teaches some things. He's like Mr. Wizard out there teaching you the difference between BEV and all other kind of stuff. So if you don't understand some of the things he said today, he's making videos to teach you, which are really cool. They're really well done. I bet. Uh, just they are. Thank you for those. We are the Sustainiacs. I'm Mike Vincent, Michael Vincent on LinkedIn, the Sustainiacs on, uh, wow, on, on, on Twitter, on, on uh, uh, YouTube. Uh, we've got, uh, and on all Apple podcasts and any, anywhere you can get your podcast really is where we're sitting at. And if you got questions or ideas or want to be on the show or ask, uh, you know, anything or have ideas for us to cover, the Sustainiacs at gmail.com. Emma? Yep. And I'm OPT underscore I'm on Insta. So if that's your preferred uh, method of communication, you can always send me a message or comment. Let us know if you want us to ask Thomas any questions on the next episode, which I'm hoping there will be because this was a great, 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 nice time talking to you. So really appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having me on.
Excellent yeah. stuff. Thank you, everybody.